Good morning, everyone. You know, Minnesota Hardy. You all define Minnesota Hardy. You come out in the face of adversity, and uh, as we're supposed to be getting, we're supposed to be getting snow later. So hopefully we don't get snowed in here. So again, welcome. Is it snowing now? All right, I'm out of here. Uh, my name is Kevin Donovan, and I am a member of the Montemedi School Board. And also, I'm the development director for the foundation for Matamidi School. So I am here to give you a warm welcome this morning. And uh, it's fun. It's all this. It's like school here. You're all lined up like students. Um, we'll be passing out blue books a little bit later. There'll be a slight test. Don't worry. It won't be too hard. No, I'm kidding. Um, you've got at your place some different pieces of paper here. You've got the agenda for today. You've got a little bit taller and skinnier one that highlights some of the different things that are coming up. And so I encourage you to look at this one. There are some, um, there's the, the event today, there's one coming up, which will be the 1950, uh, 1950 and on piece in the spring, but there's also some ancillary ones that you're gonna wanna take a peek at and, and you should probably you know, think about attending. We have Jim Lane, who is a phenomenal, if you were here last time, uh, Jim Lane is a biology teacher at Montemedi Schools, and he's just an amazing, uh, inquisitive uh, person that uh, is able to work with our students in uh, ways that um, are pretty unique. And he's going to be talking about the uh, tree uh, and using biology to, to help examine uh, this area. And so he's going to be talking in depth on the tree cookie that he got from the uh, western shores of White Bear when it blew down in a storm. So encourage you to do that one. There's also one here. We uh, have a woman, her name is uh, Duchess Harris. She's a professor at McAllister College, lives in Van Ness Heights. Her daughter goes to school here, and her grandmother was the 11th human computer hired by NASA. If you remember Hidden Figures, the movie? Uh, so this is the real, uh, real life story of someone that worked uh, for NASA during the time when computers were just in their early formative years, and uh, the astronauts, like John Glenn, they. They didn't trust the big IBM computer. They trusted the, the women uh, to come do that work for them and figure out the trajectories. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Soda bread. Did everybody get a chance to get soda bread? I want to uh, thank Kathy Weiland. She worked laboriously yesterday in the kitchen right here to make it, and uh, it really turned out good. My name's Kevin Patrick Donovan, so I fully endorse this Irish soda bread. <laughs> Uh, and the interesting thing about soda bread is it's, we think of it being Irish, but the chemistry behind making soda bread, actually uh, baking soda actually originated here in North America. Indigenous peoples were the ones that developed that chemistry, which then went back to the UK and Ireland in the 1830s. Um, somewhat like pizza is from here and it's now gone back to Italy. So make sure you get a piece of that. Next, I want to introduce uh, our, our keynote speaker, Sarah Hansen, and she is the executive director for the White Bear Historical Society. And if you ever have a chance to play Trivia Pursuit with her on history, don't go there. <laughs> just don't. Um, Sarah really is, is our, she's just such an attribute to this community because she can answer just about every question out there when it, as it involves history in this area. And uh, we have, as she will tell, a very fascinating history. Uh, the other little known fact about Sarah that people don't know is she is just an ardent hockey mom. So, um, <laughs> and soccer. And soccer. Because my son has shifted sports, but yes. <laughs> So without further ado, I turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Kevin. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and, and to be clear, the, the Trivial Pursuit comment that Kevin likes to make isn't necessarily because I'll win. It's just because I'm extremely competitive. So I'm one of those who tosses the board if it's going south for me. So um, just, to, just to be sure. Uh, anyway, I do enjoy trivial, trivia of all kinds. So, and we have lots of that, lots of um, 
pieces of information that you're going to see today uh, and lots of information um, that is kind of interesting. Now, how many, being geographically located at the moment in the, on the Washington County side of the lake, with the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society, we work with all of the communities that touch the water of the lake itself. So um, that would be Birchwood, Delwood, Matamidi, White Bear Lake, and White Bear Township. Some of the information that we have available is more bountiful for the Ramsey County side because Ramsey County, um, White Bear Lake and White Bear Township were sort of very specifically formed early on and you'll kind of see that as I go through some of the data. Um, Washington County gets a little bit more complicated and so as Kevin and I were prepping a few weeks ago we were talking about um, census data and stats uh, and I was talking about the Germans and the Scandinavians and the um, of course the French Canadians which you'll hear all about today uh, and Kevin said don't forget the Irish. And I said they were like this much in the census <laughs> around here. What I'm proud to tell you, Kevin, is that Washington County had more Irish than Ramsey County. So, <laughs> and, and more British in general, I mean more of the British Isles. So I thought that was interesting and more Scots. So um, you're in the right spot is what it comes down to. <laughs> so anyway, um, all right, well with, with all of those introductions and, and uh, pieces to get us started, as Kevin said, thank you so much for being here. It's, um, you never know, I, I know it's not horrible and we are Minnesotans um, and, and our predecessors have gone through an awful lot worse to get here, uh, you know, we have to remember that. Um, but after the last couple of weeks we've had, I wouldn't blame anybody for just giving up and staying home. <laughs> so. Uh, just a quick recap, if you were not at the first session, because this is part of a three-part series, if you were not at the very first session we had in the fall, um, which covered essentially up to roughly 1850, and these are very squishy dates, if you will, because it's just hard to draw a line in the sand and, and say this happened before, this happened after, for many things. Um, but our goal through this, this Many Faces series is um, an honoring of our legacy as a community, a recognition of our past and the various and complex interactions that have and still play a role in who we are as a larger group. We approach this work with an attitude of respect and humility. There is much to be learned from our past for each and every one of us. Today uh, is again, even though it's we're kind of in the middle section time chronologically wise, um, today is again a starting point to kind of kick off where we're at, uh, both taking us back to the story of our land and how it was created uh, and the human inhabitants of our area that have made such an impact on that land um, as we move forward to today. A starting point for conversations on where we've been, where we are now, and ultimately we are we as a community want to go in the future because we can't understand where we're going or where we are if we don't know where we came from. There are so many things that we see on a daily basis that have obvious roots in the past and we we just take them for granted. So it's um, certainly an important piece. Uh, with each session we will add more layers and attempt to bring that collective story further and further forward. Uh, as such, this three-part series will touch on examples of stories throughout the decades and centuries. Uh, from our area beginning last fall with the, Deco the Dakota and Ojibwe and continuing this today with this session uh, with the largely European based immigrants who came in the late 1800s and the early 1900s and then following this spring with the post World War II population surge as Kevin mentioned uh, and more recent arrivals primarily from Southeast Asia, Mexico and Central America. So the Wiper Lake Area Historical Society has coordinated these presentations to help lay the groundwork and the foundation for these conversations. Um, and as its executive director, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I also, um, my heritage piece falls into a few different categories, much like Kevin's Irish. I have a little bit of that and a lot of German and some French, not French Canadian. So you'll hear a little bit about some of those as we go. Um, and we'll also be hearing from uh, Peggy Peranto, who has the French Canadian piece covered. <laughs> in many ways, uh, and then John Johnson, who has the Scandinavian Norwegian side, well covered. So um, each individual story is unique. The story of a group, whether it be defined by their ethnicity, religion, citizenship, race, or other label is made up of individual stories of the members or participants of that demographic. And of course, my story is different from that of my parents or my brothers and sisters, uh, because we all have different experiences as we go. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into some of the pictures and, and uh, data here. So essentially to set the groundwork, um, we really have to go back to when uh, Minnesota was formed. Minnesota as a state, as an entity, uh, really um, dates back, well, even before Minnesota was formed. This sliver of land here, which you see on the map, is the same as what's right there. Um, 
we became, this area, this land became under the United States control, if you will, or United States government with the Louisiana Purchase <laughs> in 1803. Prior to that, we had been British, we had been French, there had been lots of things going back and forth, um, which we won't dive into too heavily. But the land, particularly that would become Minnesota, was very valuable from the sense that it had, um, as we all know, lots of lakes, lots of rivers, lots of water, which was a critical resource during those early years. Um, and so in 1805, the land in that sliver, in that, I don't know what it is, um, little finger if you will, uh, includes what would eventually become the territory or the space, the land for Fort Snelling, and was part of a transaction that's de much debated to this day uh, as far as whether or not it was legal, whether or not it was fair, um, and whether or not those negotiating were actually authorized to do so. So it's, um, it, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there, but we are actually part of that small little piece. That's a whole other presentation that we should probably have at some point because I could spend an hour just on that. Um, but once that happened in 1805, multiple treaties continued, or multiple agreements and, and treaties uh, throughout the 18, early 1800s into the mid 1800s. And so each different color is another section of land that was ceded by the indigenous people to the US government for settlement. What that meant essentially was that land then became available for land grants, for settlement, um, and typically what happened first, as is common, once land was opened, if you will, or, or became officially available, uh, it was surveyed. And, and not necessarily just surveyed from the boundary standpoint like we think of today, but surveyed for many things, including natural resources. So if the land had copper on it, if the land had water or timber or other resources that the government could use, that was classified differently than land that was just farmland or land that was had other um, purposes. So essentially, fairly quickly, um, all of that was determined uh, by the 18, by 1850 or so. Um, that was pretty well determined, and the area started to open for land settlement. For us, here in White Bear Lake and around the lake, the land, nearest land office was in Stillwater, which is not entirely shocking. Um, and people would come register their tract that they wanted and um, would move in pretty quickly. The um, and we will move relatively quickly through through basically a century. But um, so this map actually shows it's 1888, so we jump ahead a bit. Um, but I like it because, as you can imagine, working with with municipalities in two different counties in Ramsey County on the west and Washington County on the east, uh, it's not always easy to find an atlas <laughs> that encompasses the whole territory in one. And so this one does. So I pulled it for the mere fact to be able to show that. Literally, if you're not familiar, uh, the county line goes directly through the center of the lake itself, of White Bear Lake itself, uh, north and south. And so it's about half on the, the Washington County side and about half on the Ramsey County side. The um, population, as you can see around here, by 1888, the darker parts are actually land areas that have been platted. So they've been laid out and designed. Um, that's a pretty good pretty balanced map, really. Um, now, it doesn't mean people actually bought those properties or those lots or whatever, um, but they were ready for people all around, which is kind of impressive um, and fairly early on. The, jump ahead here. The biggest push, hands down, uh, to get people here was the railroad. So while the land became available in the 1850s around the lake area, uh, for sure, it was really not that populated until after the railroad came to town. And so the depot at White Bear, the railroad line from St. Paul to White, the White Bear side of the lake, opened in September of 1868. We just celebrated the 150th anniversary last fall of the railroad coming to town. And that was a game changer. Absolutely changed everything. The um, railroad, we'll see a map in a minute that shows some of the other transportation routes, but the railroad um, literally ushered in what we call the golden resort era of White Bear. The resorts around the lake, on all sides of the lake, um, boomed from 1870 to about 1910. And it's no coincidence that it was you know, a year or two after the railroad had come that the, boom, the resorts started to pick up. They had been there since the early, late 1850s, early 1860s, some of them, but they really blossomed once the railroad came. And it's, it's not 
I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's not really a secret or a surprise. Um, the railroad took a three hour wagon ride from St. Paul out to the lake down, which was a dirty, dusty, bumpy, noisy wagon ride down to about a 20 minute train ride which was also probably dirty, dusty, and bumpy, and noisy, uh, but it was only 20 minutes, and if you took the direct train out. Now, of course, there were other trains that stopped quite a bit and, and would have taken longer, but not bad. Uh, it also connected the capital city of St. Paul to the international port city of Duluth Superior, or international twin ports, uh, because, of course, you can get to Lake Superior through the St. Lawrence Seaway, ultimately, um, and it was a huge shipping port, and then they would bring things down to the capital city. That's not um, insignificant by any means. And of course, we were just right outside of St. Paul. So um, we happened to benefit hugely from being on that line and being able to come along. So as I mentioned, resorts all over the place. Um, by about 1880, these resorts, in the 1880s, these resorts in particular were hugely popular. Um, up here we have William Leap or William Leip's uh, resort at Cottage Park, uh, which is essentially where Kowalski's and the Wiper Shopping Center are today. So if you can imagine, this is Goose Lake in the background, Wiper Avenue, um, White Bear Lake here, and then the big resort. It was very typical to have a, a big resort building and a lot of little cottages around because people wanted different types of um, amenities. Along Lake Avenue, as you head out toward the Manitou Island Bridge in that direction, uh, you would have the Shadow Gay, the Williams House, other um, resorts very similar to each other. Again, it's a little bit tough to see this one, but again, big resort, bigger resort building and then smaller cottages around it on the grounds. And then around the lake on this side, we had the Matamidi Hotel, which a portion of which still stands, of course, on Quail, um, and uh, was once the um, preeminent hotel on this side of the lake. I always laugh, and, and if you've heard me speak on some of the resorts, you may have heard this, but one of their great advertisements in the 1890s, I think, um, was about the Matamidi Hotel was preparing to open for the season. All the things were in place, all the linens and, and whatnot were ready. And this year, for the enjoyment of the guests, they brought in an eight-foot alligator. <laughs> it's like, that would not be a selling point. <laughs> so I don't know. They had all sorts of wonderful theories on that sort of thing. Um, but appear, you know, clearly, uh, people enjoyed coming out. The, the um, demand was such that resorts popped up all over the place. Typically, most of these could accommodate several hundred people a night. So it wasn't just a, you know, 20 or 30. Now, not in accommodations that, like, we know, <laughs> like we expect today. Um, certainly not ne even necessarily indoor bathrooms or plumbing. Um, but they could certainly uh, get folks in the door, and they did. A lot of the guests came and stayed. We actually have ledgers for some of these, um, the guest actual registers for some of the locations, a few, not, not many, unfortunately. Um, but some guests came and stayed for a month or the whole summer. Um, they wouldn't necessarily just come for a couple nights. They would, they would be here for a long time. And again, it was an effort to get here. I mean, it was, even with the train, uh, it was still an effort to get here. We also know that there was a lot of advertising done in the south, in the southern United States, to encourage people to take steamboats up the Mississippi River to St. Paul and then take the train out here. Doctors actually recommended coming to the Minnesota lakes because of malaria and mosquitoes and other things that were in the south, particularly in the summer, and sending people up this way. So um, it was a very popular time. So the, the big point being that these sort of opportunities drew people to the lake from whatever um, demographics, if you will. And I will contend all the way through this, this series that it is the lake itself, it is the water itself that draws people here. Um, when it, we were talking about the indigenous peoples, it was the lake, it was the resource of the water, the fish, the, the opportunities that that brought. As the years went on, it was um, still absolutely a necessary resource, although you know, we had pumps or different wells and things that were being used over the time um, as the technology advanced, if you will. But it was the lake for swimming, for fishing, for boating, all of it, that really attracted people to its shore. The vast majority in the late 1800s and early 1900s came to get away from the heat of the city, the sickness, the illness, um, sanitary conditions you know, weren't necessarily that much better here, but the population was smaller, so it was a little bit easier to get away from some of those things. Um, I love showing the picture on the right there 
for those who may or may not be familiar, um, it's always one of my favorites anyway, but uh, that's one of the steamer boats that went on the lake, around the lake. We had several, Lake Minnetonka had several, we kind of grew up in the same concept, sort of parallel to Minnetonka. Uh, that one is named the Wildwood and there were many on the lake at different points, they had a little bit different sizing, but that boat um, had a route that would go from the shopping center area, which was the hotel over by Kowalski's, um, would go from that hotel resort area, go along Lake Avenue to the, pick up folks at the hotels there, go over eventually when Wildwood Amusement Park showed up and make its way around and around and around. When it wasn't in use for that, for transporting people, uh, it would actually have, they would put a full orchestra on the boats and have them troll in front of those resorts so people could come out and dance on the lawn or dance on the lake shore, if you can imagine. And of course, music carries over the water um, and it's just kind of a lovely image. So um, things were pretty good in this area. A lot of fun um, to be had, if you will. So the, um, we are not actually far. This is kind of fun because I always have to try to explain um, where this is. And we're not far from the site of the um, Mata Mirai Chautauqua Assembly Hall. Uh, interestingly enough, I have a new computer, which technology is not my favorite thing, so I apologize. Uh, but I have a new computer that tells me, it, it creates descriptions. It has an accessibility feature that will sh tell you what's on, what your image is, what the picture is. When I put this image on, the, in, on my screen, it popped up and it, with a little caption and it said, it's a church. I thought, actually, not exactly. I mean, it's sort of, but not exactly. Uh, and I'm not sure what about it unless they're seeing the windmills or the weather vanes as um, crosses or something. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting assessment. The um, Mata Mirai Chautauqua Hall was built just out this way, kind of out back here toward the fields, toward Hamlin Lake, um, in the 1880s. It was quite an impressive structure, if you can imagine. These are the kind of things that they sort of just popped up around the area um, relatively quickly. I'm, I'm not sure that the building codes would have past, but, um, but they were impressive and they lasted for a while. The, uh, this one uh, didn't last particularly long, but it was um, impressive while it was here. What I love about this is the imagery of the Chautauqua movement. So the movement came out of Chautauqua, New York, a name for Chautauqua, New York. It was a Methodist movement initially, and it was essentially had the purpose of training Sunday school teachers. So the idea was you would bring people together and, and give training, uh, and then it evolved into more of a um, tent revival and, and kind of on and on uh, with the idea of um, being able to have moral forms of entertainment is, is one of the, the pushes that they advertised. Um, so it was often said that you should come to the Chautauqua, you should come to the Washington County side of the lake, the, what would become Matamidi side of the lake, um, for your moral forms of entertainment and stay away from the Ramsey County side because they did immoral things like boating and dancing and card playing. Uh, so stay away from all of that. Uh, so it's a, I would say it's a good thing you're over here, right? Uh, so um, just wait till you hear about the gangsters someday. No, uh, but anyway, so this place would be packed. It's a significant size building, but it would be packed. The, the crowds were definitely there. And along here are barn doors, big barn doors that would slide back and forth and open up. But if you can imagine being here in 1890 when it was proper for a woman, if she was going out in public, to wear at least seven layers of clothing in the heat of the summer in a place like that, um, people started to turn away a little bit <laughs> as time went on, but it was still an incredibly popular place. That generated a lot of the cottages, um, the Chautauqua cottages that you may be familiar with um, throughout, but basically between Montemita Avenue and the lake. Uh, those were actually built to, uh, to be purchased by Chautauqua goers, um, also to be rented, of course, and then tent villages and, and uh, structures popped up. And if you weren't interested in any of those options, you had the Montemita Hotel as your choice. So, um, in addition to uh, coming by boat or by train on the um, west side of the lake, you could certainly make your way around the, the railroad ultimately connected around the north end into Delwood in that area. Um, Delwood was quieter, as you, just kind of like it is today. It didn't have a commercial district, didn't have, has never had that. Um, its biggest social piece or gathering piece is, would, has always been the White Bear Yacht Club. Um, the club actually started, you see the first clubhouse building behind the gentleman there on the dock. Uh, the club actually started in 1889 and ended up in its early years, had some back and forth for a little bit, 
uh, but by the 1890s ended up renting a hotel that was built by a gentleman named Kirby Barnum. Barnum thought that he could actually go and expand the, um, basically develop the Delwood Shore, uh, but he was about two generations too early because people just weren't quite willing to go that far yet. And so um, he ended up, unfortunately, losing his shirt and uh, sold the hotel to the club, and they ultimately um, renovated over the years and rebuilt and, and did other things. But that was kind of Delwood's piece on that shore. So essentially, if you wanted to get here, you could. You could go all the way around the lake. You could do all sorts of things. So um, this is actually the streetcar map, which is one of my favorites. It brings you up from St. Paul to Wildwood Amusement Park, the Wildwood area right here at the southernmost tip of the lake. You could, of course, go around into Matamidi, which was available into the 1950s. Um, you could go straight out to Stillwater, straight out east, which ended in 1932. Or you could come up around this way and go into downtown White Bear, which also ended in 1932. So the Matamidi line stayed the longest, um, but the other two actually were cut off in the 30s. When, they wanted, when the streetcar company, the transit company, wanted to start pushing buses more heavily. If you made it into downtown White Bear, you have the railroad that can go north, straight north to Duluth, or you can curve around the lake into Delwood, which meets up again with the streetcar. So no matter where you wanted to go, there was a way to get there, whether on land or by boat. Um, and that was key for the development and, and what attracted people to our area. So Wildwood was another push. Um, and there was lots of fun to be had, of course, as you can imagine. As early as the 1890s, the, the ad on the left is from 1893, upper left there. Um, they had amusements. They had water slides and all sorts of fun things. Uh, the amusement park was owned by the streetcar company. So the idea was that it, they built it, they invested in it because they wanted people to use the streetcars on evenings and weekends. They wanted people to come to the end of the line, uh, not just to commute to work in the city during the week. Um, and it was a, a vastly popular place until then, again, until the 1930s when things started to transition. So um, by the 1930s, the um, shift was happening. The resorts had died down. And again, it was transportation that was really pushing this. Uh, the resorts had died down because people had the freedom to go where they wanted by then. Um, Minnesota was much more settled. Automobiles were tried and true. I mean, they were still tough, but they were, <laughs> they were better than they were in 1910. Um, and so you didn't have to rely on the railroad to take you wherever you wanted to go or the streetcar tracks to take you wherever you wanted to go. Um, infrastructure was starting to change. And instead of living in St. Paul and coming to spend weeks or months or the entire season here in the summer around the lake, you could actually live out here and go back and forth fairly easily. Um, with your automobile or if you wanted the streetcars or the depot or the, the trains. Uh, I love this photo because it literally symbolizes that transition in time. Uh, so this is the depot that stands still today in White Bear Lake at 4th Street and Highway 61. It was brand new in this photo in August of 1935. This building is in the process of being torn down and it is the original 1868 depot that was built when the railroad came to town. It, it had been expanded and contracted over the years, but it's the core of the original structure. That train shed that I showed in one of the earlier photos came out this way. Um, if you're familiar with this depot at all, this single track still remains. Um, at one point, there were as many as 14 tracks across this area. This single, the single track still remains, and right here, where the old depot was, is Highway 61. So, the, rail, or the automobile literally took over where the railroad used to run. Um, I, that symbolism never ceases to strike me. The um, other things that were happening, the population was starting to boom. The idea of having people live here year round wasn't very solid up until the 1920s and certainly as we get into the 1930s. So um, as the population began to grow and climb in the 1920s, we needed more infrastructure. Uh, this is the original Lincoln Town High School that sat here, essentially, where the district center is today um, and was built in 1931. We have the um, fire station in White Bear that was constructed in 1930. Uh, it was, there was a wood frame building fire station that had been there prior to that, uh, but needed to be replaced because they needed room for bigger trucks. Um, 
these are not exactly huge trucks. Uh, but that building today is actually the Domino's Pizza across from US Bank and, and the library in downtown White Bear. And if you look at those plate glass windows, those were the garage doors. The, the, I mean, they were not big trucks, uh, but it's hard to envision. And of course, a generation later, by the 1960s, we had to do, in the 60s and 70s, we had to do a lot of these things again because the population continued to boom. So um, to give, I, I could go on and on and on with stats um, and to give, to, to not do that to you, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll give a quick overview. Uh, so if you look at, it, it gets complicated quickly for starters. So as I mentioned, the Ramsey County side is a little bit more straightforward from our perspective, our territory area, if you will. Uh, White Bear Village, which would eventually become the city of White Bear, was formed in 1881. So for example, there was no 1860 census with it. White Bear Township um, was the entire area that is today um, Vadness Heights, Gem Lake, North Oaks, uh, the city of White Bear Lake, and White Bear Township still. So it was 36 square miles. So it's, it's a little bit tough to kind of grasp that, as was Greenfield Township, which was the original name of what would eventually become Grant Township, because there was another Greenfield Township already, so they couldn't have that name anymore. But in 1860, it was still Greenfield Township. Um, and so it isn't just what we know today as sort of the Matamidi, Delwood, Birchwood community. Um, it, it, the boundaries are a little bit different. but. We didn't have a lot of folks, even with much greater boundaries. If you look at this, um, about 350, 360 people all around the lake area permanently. Now again, this was early. The railroad hadn't made it here yet. And the, um, even as the years went on a little bit, it was still very much a summer place. It was not a place to live year round necessarily. There, there were definitely year round residents, but the census was typically taken with the people who lived here, not who vacationed here, if you will. So as you jump ahead to um, 1885, a generation or so later, you can see um, this wasn't as easily available for um, Grant Township, but you can see the numbers start to grow significantly. Uh, and by then, the village of White Bear has been formed, and it's about half and half, roughly, population within the village, which is interesting because the village was just the core downtown area as we know it today of White Bear Lake. So, if you think about the population density in that core area, kind of by the resorts and by along Lake Avenue and, and in the downtown, and then the rest of that whole area, which was mostly farmland, it, it's interesting that the population was about the same. Again, jump ahead um, to 1910, still fairly comparable. Um, it's starting to shift though, more toward the village. Uh, and on this side of the lake in Grant Township for the 1910 census, uh, we have 747 residents in Grant Township. So by 1930, um, oh, I don't know why it's up there. Uh, so by 1930, we've shifted. The, the um, municipalities of Lincoln Township have been formed out of Greenfield or Grant. Uh, Matamidi will soon be formed. Delwood, uh, Birchwood, and Birchwood have been formed. So essentially, this population all around the lake is now over 6,000. It's about 6,300 people, if you can envision. Still, the vast majority are on the west side of the lake, um, but there are some interesting differences between the two as we talked. So, a lot of folks make assumptions that um, White Bear itself is filled with French Canadians. And it, it is, it was, uh, and I'm not gonna, not gonna step on Peggy's parade by any means, <laughs> but it's interesting. Because in addition to the French Canadians, um, there were almost, not quite equally, but significant numbers of German, Swedish, Norwegian, uh, German, Swedish, Norwegian were the main ones on the Ramsey County side of the lake. When you get over to the, now the populations were quite lower, so it's a percentage can, is, you know, a couple of people can change a percentage number pretty quickly. Uh, but when you get over to the um, Washington County side of the lake, it's kind of interesting because you get into seeing some other categories, if you will. Um, Luxembourg was heavily represented on this side of the lake. Denmark, um, Ireland was stronger, and really England in general um, showed up much more heavily than on the Ramsey County side of the lake. So it's kind of an interesting mix. Uh, to bring us 
kind of into that from a personal perspective, much like we did in the last session, we have a couple of speakers. I will start uh, by introducing Peggy Peranto, uh, who can come on up. She's our French Canadian representative, if you will, uh, <laughs> to speak for all the French Canadians. My roots in White Bear Lake go back prior to 1863. My connection is through both the Vadness and the Peltier lineage. My cousin Cynthia Vadness is our amazing family historian, and she helped me compile the information that I'll be sharing with you. I've always known that my maternal grandparents were French Canadian. My maiden name is O'Neill. We know very little of my father's side, but with that name, I always said I was half French and French Canadian, half Irish. I submitted uh, an ancestry kit. The DNA results were very interesting. 36% Ireland, Scotland, 33% France, 23% England, Wales, and Northwest Europe, showing a migration to the St. Lawrence River through French settlers. When Cynthia took her parents to the Three Rivers area in Canada to do research, she found names on the gravestones in the cemeteries that were the same names as the names on the graves at St. Mary's Cemetery. The migration was very obvious. One story is that a parish priest from Three Rivers came to White Bear and that his congregation followed him. This area is north of Vermont between Montreal and Quebec City. You can see the, the red dot on the map. Um, which is Yamaska, Canada. My grandfather's side. Great-great-grandfather Francois Vadness was born in 1826 in Yamaska, Canada on the St. Lawrence River. He married Therese Al Hous Le Monde in 1848 in Richelieu, Quebec. Great-grandfather William Vadness, their son, was born in 1863 in Centerville. He is the tall boy on uh, the back row on the left. He married Genevieve Belargen, who was born in 1866. They married in Centerville in 1881. Both of her parents were born in Centerville. In 1897, Genevieve filed abandonment, and William moved to Upper Peninsula, Michigan. <laughs> Their son, my grandfather, Adler Vadness, was born in 1888 in White Bear Lake. My grandmother's side. Albert Peltier was born in 1860 in Little Canada. His parents were birth, both born in Canada and are buried in Little Canada. He married Marie Celestine de Rozier in Little Canada in 1884. She had been born in Canada. Her father was born in Yamaska, Canada and died in White Bear Lake. He is buried at St. Mary's Cemetery. Her mother was born in Canada and died in St. Paul. Grandma's dad, Albert Peltier, was born in this house located off of Lake Badness. It was the oldest home in Ramsey County when it was torn down. My grandmother, Ellen Peltier, was born to them in 1888 in Centerville, where she attended school. My grandparents married in 1910 in Little Canada and had 12 children. Two passed away very young. 11 out of the 12 were physically born in this little house at 1309 4th Street. My mother was the third oldest. She used to tell me that she was really sure when the doctor was called and came to their house, he brought a black bag. And there was a baby in that bag because there was no baby before. He left and now there's a baby. Two years ago, the 4th Street house was on the historical house tour. It's changed quite a bit from that, but it's not real big. I had the privilege to work at it with a couple of my cousins. I do not know how they fit the whole family in the house. Grandpa worked for the railroad then went into the gasoline fuel oil business, first with a partner and then on his own in 1928. There was a gas pump in their front yard. Stories have it that grandma would pump gas and sell her bread. We've heard that gangsters frequented their business. 
White Bear Oil was built in 1932 on the corner of 4th and Bald Eagle Avenue. They were a hardworking, loving pair. Of the surviving 10 children, only one moved out of White Bear Lake, all the way to Matamidi. <laughs> <laughs> all five sons worked for their father at White Bear Oil, also <coughs> two of the daughters and a son-in-law. My mom is in the back row, um, second from the left. <coughs> and this is kind of fun. Auntie Mae, in the, she's the baby in the middle on the floor, or sitting on the floor, um, worked at the bank. They all had her dresses on for that picture. I just think that's funny that nobody had fancy dresses, but Auntie Mae worked and had quite a wardrobe, so we shared. <laughs> Only French was spoken in my grandparents' home until the children started school. Unfortunately, being bilingual wasn't appreciated then. Being members of St. Mary's Church was important to the family. Grandpa hauled stone for the most current building. The children attended St. Mary's School. Just as the church was central to families in Canada, it continued to be an essential piece of life here. I have 42 first cousins. Growing up, our families would gather at Grandma and Grandpa's house Christmas morning and enjoy a meal of French meat pie made from ground pork. Also on the menu was blood sausage, head cheese, homemade cinnamon rolls, bread, and cranberries. Making meat pie continues to be a tradition we cousins are also proud of. Even our four-year-old grandsons can roll the lard crust out with the best of them. <laughs> now the 43 cousins and their families gather annually for a fun picnic. We fill up Podvin Park and continue to make memories and share our history. Growing up, it seemed like we were related to everyone. Walks through the town or through the cemetery, with my mom, I met lots of relatives, alive and gone. She was as surprised and stunned as I was when I found out 40 years ago at my wedding that my husband is my third cousin once removed. <laughs> and that is, that Explains proves it. it. So at the very bottom is our first grandson, who's his own fifth cousin. It's like, what? <laughs> Francois Vadness is our connection. You just never know what genealogy is going to turn up. Thank you. Genealogy can, and, the, and the study of history in general can definitely be a be careful what you look for or be careful what, you, what you're asking sort of thing. Um, with that, I'd like to actually in introduce uh, John W. Johnson next, grandson of John O. Johnson, the Johnson Boat Works founder, to tell a little bit about how their family came to White Bear because it's a very different migration than the French Canadian. <laughs> so, here we go. Oh, my family uh, history includes ancestors from Norway and Sweden. There's a little picture of Norway there. It's a beautiful country, but only about 4% of the land is suitable for farming. Uh, three of my grandparents came from Norway. My dad's father, John O. Johnson, came from Norway in 1893. And this is a, a farm in Sweden where my great-grandfather was born, and then he later moved to Norway. I've done some uh, research about the immigration of Norwegians and Swedes to America. In the 1860s, there were problems in Norway and Sweden with uh, crop failures, a poor economy, and uh, overpopulation for the farming community. In America, after the Civil War, there was a need for more workers and farmers, especially in the large areas in the Midwest. So the Homestead Act in 1862 promised 160 acres if you would occupy and farm the land for five years. Uh, Minnesota and other states are actually printing up documents, uh, advertisements, sending them overseas to Norway and so forth. Say, come, come to America, we have land for you. And uh, relatives who were already living here were sending letters back to the old country saying how wonderful it was here. And they actually would send money for their transportation. Uh, in the early settlers that came by ship, 
That would take uh, five or six weeks if they came by a sailing ship. And in the uh, 1876 to 1890, more than 225,000 Norwegians and 500,000 Swedes came to America. That was 10% of the population of Norway came to America in those years. Uh, most of the immigrants were poor farmers or laborers, and at first many settled in Wisconsin and they moved on to Minnesota. And now Minnesota has the highest percentage of any state of Scandinavian background, 32%. So these uh, immigrants came to here and they uh, tried to maintain some of their old country uh, traditions. They built Lutheran churches where at first many of the services were conducted in Norwegian or Swedish. Looking at the 1880 census in White Bear, there were 11 people born in Norway and 52 from Sweden. One of the Norwegians in the 1880 census was Nicholas Peterson. His occupation listed as a sailor. He came to America around 1863 and then spent some years in Wisconsin where he met his wife, Ingeborg Jensen. In White Bear, Nicholas started a boat rental business at the west end of the lake, about where the VFW Club is located now. In the 1885 issue of the Norwest magazine, they described his business. Nicholas Peterson of Cottage Park has a fine fleet of 40 rental boats comprising sailboats, rowboats, and canoes. Mr. Peterson is an old Norwegian sailor having an original an amusing way of expressing himself, <laughs> which gives zest and character to his sailor yarns. <laughs> Nicholas was the first of four Norwegian sailors to set up boat businesses in White Bear. The second one was Andrew Peterson, who arrived here in 1882. Andrew started making rowboats and later worked on and off for Gus Amundsen making sailboats. Then in 1893, Andrew Peterson moved to Excelsior where he made sailboats for Lake Minnetonka. The next Norwegian sailor was Gustav Amundsen. And this is actually a picture of his family in 1904. Uh, Gus Amundsen's father came to America in 1871 and lived in Brooklyn, New York. Over the years, other family members followed. Gus arrived in 1882, and the family moved to Wisconsin. Gus Amundsen then went back to Norway, married Marie Hansen in 1887, and they moved to White Bear Lake that same year where he started his boat works. Two years later, Gus and Marie went back to Horten, Norway to visit Marie's family. While there, he met 14-year-old John O. Johnson. Gus told John, if you come to America, you can work it for me building sailboats. In Norway, John O. Johnson had worked on a coastal steamer delivering supplies to, to towns on the coast. He also worked one summer on a small whaling ship. When he reached the age of 18 in 1893, he immigrated to America. He crossed the Atlantic on the steamship Thingvalla. The steamship, steamship took 15 days for the trip. John o. Johnson's steamship ticket included a train travel to as far as Chicago. At the, at the Chicago uh, depot, he managed to find a Norwegian trainman who said, you can ride with me in the caboose to St. Paul. When he got to St. Paul, he hitched a ride on a uh, tradesman's wagon to White Bear Lake and showed up at Gus Amundsen's door. <laughs> uh, during the time he worked for Gus Amundsen for three years, uh, John often sailed on the sailboats on White Bear Lake. In 1896, John started his own business, the Johnson Boat Works. 
That same year, he married Mary Peterson, the daughter of Ingeborg and Nicholas Peterson. By 1900, John O. Johnson was well known as a successful boat builder. And this is a picture of, of the boat he built in 1900. I was born in 1935, and over the years I heard many stories about my grandfather. Oh, before I mention that, I'd like to uh, say that one of my Norwegian grandmothers made this sweater for me about 60-some <laughs> uh, years ago. Oh my gosh. So anyway, I, I had heard many stories about my grandfather, John O. Johnson, so I wrote a book, John O. Johnson from Norway to White Bear Lake, and recently gave that book to the White Bear Lake Historical Society, and they have it for sale. So that's it. Perfect. Thank you, John. I, I think between John's sweater and um, Peggy's Vadnus family sweatshirt, I'm feeling a little out of the group. <laughs> My mom knits, but not uh, not quite like that. They're not, whatever. Uh, not from the, the Norwegian perspective, anyway. So. Um, you've heard a lot from me, but this is one that I'm I was intrigued by with my family heritage, uh, and so I'm going to share a little bit of that story with you as well. So, much like many of us, we are, have lots of different mixtures of, of um, heritage, I guess. Uh, my family is primarily French, Danish, and German, and French. Uh, my maiden name was Marcou, or is Marcou, and I'm often asked if I'm French Canadian, being from White Bear. And the Marcous absolutely were not French Canadian. In fact, I'm not sure that many of them ever set foot in Canada. Uh, they took a completely different route. And this time of year, I like to sort of um, joke about that because they came from France. They went from France to Denmark because of the religious wars and things that were happening in France. Uh, and then got into a little bit of a pinch in Denmark um, and ended up going down to the Danish West Indies in the Caribbean and then made their way back to the United States, what would eventually become the United States. Uh, so absolutely a different direction in, in this time of year. I think, why did you go to Philadelphia after that? You could have just stayed, <laughs> but it's all good. Uh, but it was definitely an interesting um, process. Now, my mother's side of the family, uh, my mother's maiden name was Oldenburg and very German. She always swore, much like Peggy, that she was 100% German based on her surnames. Her, her, her mother's maiden name was Ludke and her maiden name was um, Oldenburg. So she um, was guaranteed that she was 100% German. Uh, interestingly enough, my dad always swore that he was 100% French, which wasn't even remotely possible based on his surnames and whatnot. Uh, but anyway, interestingly enough, um, when we did an Ancestry DNA kit for my mom, she came up about 85% German, so she wasn't too far off. Uh, and that's not unusual, knowing their migration story, if you will. Uh, so this is my, let's see, this is my grandmother and a couple of my aunts, and then my great-grandmother, Julia. Julia um, Koenig, which was translated into King when they came to Minnesota uh, in the 1850s, and uh, married a Ludke. She became a Ludke. Uh, they ended up farming in Farmington, Minnesota, down in the southern, southern metro area. Uh, and this is my grandmother, Edna, and my grandfather, John. Uh, John's family was the Oldenburgs, and they came from or lived in Prior Lake. So again, good farming communities, uh, fairly typical. Much of their area or, or town in Germany picked up and, and made their way, and much, much like the Norwegian or Scandinavian side, they would write back and send for more people to follow along and, and sort of took over the um, farming side of things, if you will. So my mom's story is fairly standard, is a fairly standard Minnesota migration story. Um, my dad's, as I said, has a, a couple little hiccups in it or a couple little goofy things that are unusual. Uh, the gentleman, the tall gentleman in the back, his name is John Prince, John Stottenberg Prince. Now, with a middle name like Stottenberg, you've got to believe there's got to be some German in there somewhere. Um, but my dad was convinced that they were all French. Well, my dad's primarily British and German and French and Danish. Um, there was a, a mixture of things. But uh, they actually did what was fairly common. They came into the United States and, and in the, on the East Coast and eventually made their migration west through Ohio and um, uh, Kentucky and some other places as they made their way 
there's kind of a mixture from that perspective. And then there's the Marcoux side, the gentleman seated on the right there um, in the front, is William Marcoux and his wife um, Mariah. Uh, William is the reason we are here at White Bear Lake because they came, he, so it was his family, his grandfather was the one who decided to leave the island of St. Croix down in the, what is today the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, was then the Danish West Indies. He had several plantations down there and moved to Philadelphia. Um, in the, in before, um, about the time of the revolution, actually. He came in 1770 and was there during the revolution. He was actually appointed um, captain of one of the troops, the first city troop in Philadelphia, and had to step down because he was a Danish citizen. And Denmark was neutral in the revolution. So there's a lot of, he would have lost all of his land holdings. Um, so as time went on, his grandson made his way to the west. He was an Episcopalian minister and he made his way to Wisconsin to open a mission near Milwaukee. Uh, and then he was studying and doing a number of things and he converted to Catholicism, which put him out of a job, clearly. Uh, <laughs> he was also married and had two boys at that point, um, which didn't allow him to become a Catholic priest. So he was kind of stuck. Um, so he decided to come to this up and coming new place called St. Paul, which had just been formed. And uh, in 1856, he showed up in Minnesota and by, he, he was also he, a very different kind of fella. He was, he was very smart, but he loved, I think he was a little bit of an adrenaline junkie and a little bit of an inventor, um, but he loved flight. And of course, in the 1860s, 1850s, you don't get a lot of flight around anywhere. Um, and so he was obsessed with hot air balloons. And so he actually flew the first hot air balloon in the state of Minnesota in 1857. He, he did three attempts, all failed pretty miserably. Uh, but, but the one that took him the farthest went from uh, the, the, basically where the state capital is today, um, out of St. Paul and north, oh, it was the second attempt, it took him north over Wiper Lake and he landed up by Wyoming, Minnesota on somebody's farm field and was brought back to um, St. Paul. When he got back, he asked, what lake that was, that big, beautiful lake, because that's where he wanted to live. And so by 1862, he had built this cottage on the shore of White Bear Lake. Uh, and it still stands, it's a, it's a house, it's been changed quite a bit over the years, um, but it still stands there. So he is the, the key piece that links us to White Bear. Um, he's also the one I curse on mornings like we had last week. Uh, <laughs> so don't get me wrong, I, I love him and I, it's a love-hate thing. Um, but again, for our family and, and for people in general, the lake has always been such a huge draw. Um, I love this photo. It's actually one of our little tiny family snapshots. But it's about 20 of the family members out on the dock off of Lake Avenue near Shady Lane there. Um, and William, this is probably 1910-ish. Um, William, the one who flew the hot air balloon in 1857, is the fellow standing over here. Uh, he believed strongly that daily activity in the water itself was very important. So um, the point of sharing these different pieces is, is again to emphasize the fact that everyone's story is unique. We may have broad patterns. We may have French Canadians coming because of a connection to a church or a parish priest, which was very typical, very common. Um, we may have the Scandinavian, Norwegian, Swedish groups coming because they were sort of pulling each other along, which was very common with many of the, the demographic groups. Um, we may have uh, really unusual stories, as I said, um, and there's always a push and a pull, of course. Um, often it's because in Europe there wasn't enough farmland left or the potato famines in Ireland or different things, the reasons that the, 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 this was very attractive. But if you can imagine the risk of getting up and moving your entire family or, your, or even just your own self, um, often with very little to come here and try to create something, they were pretty adventurous and pretty hardy. Um, and then there are the other groups like mine that are often pushed out. And as the family story goes, um, the religious wars were one thing and they went to Denmark. Uh, my family is known for being, as I maybe mentioned earlier, a little competitive um, <laughs> about things and uh, sometimes stubborn. There's a German thing in there and, and you know, a lot of other pieces. Um, but when they were in Denmark, the law, as, this is a family story and I've not yet been able to verify it and I don't know that I'll ever be able to, but there was a law in the early 1700s that um, only the king could use white horses. Only the king's carriage could have white horses. So my family thought they were really snazzy and smart 
and supposedly hitched up white mules to their carriage and rode in front of the palace. Um, they were suddenly in the Caribbean. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, if it would work here, I might try that. But it's, it's an interesting, the stories are always unique as to why and how and where. Uh, but it was kind of an intriguing thing. So uh, we have a little bit of time and I'd like to um, do a, a little activity. Lisa, if you'll help me pass those pieces out. Um, we are set up, so this activity is, is a census one and um, instead of, typically I, I do this, we do this with kids, with students in classrooms and we make them get up and move around the room to get their wiggles out. We can probably do it by a show of hands just as easily with this group. Um, I don't know that you guys have to get wiggles out, but if you want to get up and move, you can. Uh, but the, uh, everyone's going to get an identity card um, and on one side is the 1860 census. And on the flip side is the 1930 census data. So you'll have a, you'll be a person in 1860 or 1930, um, and we'll have a few extras left over. We planned for 50, and I tried to make it as proportionate as possible to the census data itself. Um, but it's um, always hard to do it precisely. Uh, so we don't even with the snow. I think we have a little bit less than 50, but we'll we'll play with it and make it work. So. If we look at the 1860 census, uh, side first please, it says the, it has the year up on the top. Um, raise your hand if you are from Greenfield Township, if your identity at the top is Greenfield Township. Okay, so a decent, decent proportion, all right, and then the others should be from White Bear Township, if you, okay, perfect, so relatively um, evenly split. Uh, again, it's going to be off a little bit because we don't have quite as many people as we had planned for to do the numbers, but um, raise your hand, it, wh no matter where you live, raise your hand if you are male on your card. Okay. All right, so again about half and half I think, um, which is about right. It was typically never more than about 53 to 47 percent you know, versus 50-50, it was often very close. Um, we were not necessarily, like a lot of the places up in northern Minnesota would have a high male population because of the lumber camps and things like that. We were not that. People would come as families and as groups. So it was usually pretty balanced. Um, if it was out of whack, it, there were more men than women, but not, it usually wasn't too far out of whack, if you will. Um, raise your hand if your race is listed as white. So everybody's hand should be up for 1860. Um, interestingly enough, and this is, these are the people who were counted as residents of those two townships during that time. Um, interestingly enough, it isn't until the 1880 census, I believe, that anyone other than white is listed in any number at all. And at that point, there are 14 people of color listed in the census in this area, and that's it. And, and each of them is listed with an occupation as, um, being either a servant or staff at one of the hotels. So, and once the hotels are gone, by 1910 or so, um, that number drops away again. So it's, it's really kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. No, no. Um, typically, yeah, the, the push was, of course, to remove Native Americans at that point, um, and they really weren't recording. They were trying to do that under, they did certain census calculations with reservations or with different places, but not in the general population. Um, in the, although in the 1930, I thought this was interesting, this was later of course, on the 1930 side of the census, um, there was one Native American woman listed in the Lincoln Township side, um, and she had a son that was listed as mixed, a baby that was listed as mixed by 1930. But again, vastly, not a lot of, not a lot of um, diversity from that standpoint. Our diversity was, which European country did you come from initially? Where did your grandparents come from? Where did your, and, and that was significant. That was a big deal. There were um, both, I think, John and um, Peggy mentioned uh, talking, talk, speaking French or Swedish or Norwegian at home or at church or whatever the case may be in those early years. And that was very, very common. Most of the churches that were built, for example, around the lake in those early decades, were done in the native language initially. So um, the Catholic Church masses were said in French to begin with. The, um, the Lutheran churches were Swedish and German, typically. I mean, that was very, very common. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> and it wasn't until 
really, um, well, it faded, of course, over the years. But by World War I, it was frowned upon to speak German or to speak certain languages. Um, and and you know, the idea was nationalism and focusing on here, and we all have to be the same. So let's wash that out as much as possible. So. Um, all right, so if you flip to the 1930 side, flip your card over, it's a completely different person. Um, raise your hand if um, you are male. That should be about the same, half and half, okay? Uh, raise your hand if you are listed as um, Lincoln Township. Okay, we lost some of those. There should be a few more Lincoln Townships. <laughs> but all right, raise your hand. Is, do we have a Delwood out there? at all? Yeah, there should be one Delwood in a crowd of 50. Um, how about Birchwood? Anybody listed as Birchwood? All right, they must have been at the back of the pile. Uh, <laughs> so one Birchwood as well to kind of balance them out. The, um, and then if you are from um, the uh, Ramsey County side, Wiper Township or Wiper Village, um, you should, you know, basically the rest of the group. But um, Interestingly, of course, as you can imagine, the census data changes. The questions that they ask changes. The 1860 census was pretty basic. It had, um, you know, obviously the name, the occupation, your birthplace, your age, those are your gender, your, your race. Um, pretty simple things. The 1930 census went into much greater detail, as you can, as you can envision. Um, so if you are, raise your hand, if listed on the census, wherever you are from, if you are listed as the head of a household. Okay. Of those, are any of you women? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there were a few. Typically, a woman was not listed as a head of a household unless she was widowed um, or divorced, but more often widowed. Um, the... Uh, Raise your hand if your birthplace was Minnesota by 1930. That was pretty significant. Uh, I believe by 1930, all the way around pretty consistently, it was 69 or 70 percent were Minnesota born around the lake by 1930. So the, the 1800s immigration wave was big, but it had really settled down by the time we hit 1930. Um, how many of you have one or both parents born somewhere else? So see, again, a generation prior, it was a bigger deal. Um, of those, raise your hand again if that was your, if you just had your hand up, um, and if that was from another state in the United States. Okay, one of the patterns that we see is that um, often Minnesota is almost always Minnesota is not the first stop. Uh, people will come. John, you talked about uh, uh, Gus Amundsen being in Wisconsin, for example. Um, they, they would land somewhere in the east or at least in Chicago, get to the, by train to Chicago and then sort of spread out from there. Um, they'd eventually make their way to Minnesota and certainly not necessarily White Bear Lake immediately, but they would eventually make their way to Minnesota. It's interesting, and we'll talk more about this in the spring session, but um, it's interesting because that is very similar to today, so immigration patterns. Um, we are not, and of course we're not a giant metropolis, particularly out here, um, and don't necessarily have the services or the structure to have people come right away. But it's interesting to me that um, from our census data, once you start getting into when census data was kept for Minnesota, because of course the first census at all in Minnesota was in 1857. Well, there was an 1849, 1850 territorial census, um, but really uh, 1857 in preparation for statehood in 1858. And then from there, the federal census were done on the tens, just like they still are. And the state census data was collected um, on the fives. They're not nearly as informative. They were pretty simple, um, but we're still glad we have them um, up until 1905. The, um, some of the other pieces, uh, if you have an occupation listed on the 1930 census, raise your hand. Are there any interesting ones? Feel free to share. Huh? Okay. Which was a big new thing. Locomotive engineer. Okay. Priest. Mm -hmm. Priest, I, that one caught my attention too. There are several people who live in that household too. I thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> now, the border, borders and servants, or you know, um, housekeepers, that sort of thing. Commercial traveler. Commercial traveler? Wow. Who is it? Huh. 
I think he, well. Like so Ed Martin and Sons was a big distributor in town for years after, so like, that's interesting, okay. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Any other fun ones that were listed? Pardon? Okay, railroad, yep, that would make sense. Are there any women that have occupations? Good question. Are there any women listed with occupations? Okay. Housekeeper. Housekeeper. Now, what household are you in out of curiosity, Dick? What household number are you in? It should be up in the upper right. Oh, 18. Is that the household for the priest? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're his housekeeper. <laughs> Just so you know. I think that was the only housekeeper I saw listed as a housekeeper. Most were servants. Um, so that's why, why I asked. Um, it, it, it is interesting. And of course, by 1930, women were more likely. Now, the 1860 side, I believe, has occupations listed, although there were far less. Oh, you've got a good one. Um, if you flip back to the 1860 side, uh, raise your hand if you have an interesting um, occupation listed. Hotel keeper. OK. When all the resorts were, <laughs> and he was one of the early ones. I believe that's a Benson, I'm guessing. J.B. Murray. Or Murray, sorry. OK, that makes more sense. Yep. Please. So farm laborer is a garcelle? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and, and interestingly enough, one of the other things, and I didn't want to make this too complicated, but one of the other things that um, reading census data is always entertaining because, of course, number one, human error is just what it is on all levels. So the census taker was often someone who wasn't super educated as far as um, traditional school education anyway. Uh, often a third or fourth grade education, and they got the job because they weren't working in other ways. Um, so they would go out and they would capture, um, so you've all probably heard the stories, but they would capture names um, as they heard them. And, and didn't necessarily, and sometimes the people that they, one of the other questions that we capture is, can you read and write? Because often the families giving the information didn't know any better if they wrote it down wrong. So for example, on some of the census data, Garso, which is a very common Ramsey County name for Badness Heights and some is one of the earliest families, um, was listed as Gerson, G-E-R-S-O-N. So you have to be very um, creative <laughs> with some of those. Uh, there's a Belland family that's in here somewhere. Um, the alternative to that was um, B-E-D-L-A, U G H, if you can imagine, um, in one of the. But it, they, we had a volunteer who went through who is amazing, um, and matched up year after year the families and went through and said, you know, there's there's not we don't have two families that have exactly the same names of children at the same ages living in the same vicinity. Um, these have to be mistranslated. And of course, the human error goes to the other side. Um, you know, you look at the what they wrote down, and then you have to capture it and try to bring it forward into today and. Um, create something out of it. So there's a ton of information. And even if your family is not in the census for this area or for wherever, um, it's amazing what you can learn about an area that you're interested in uh, going after some of that data. Um, I, Lisa was laughing at me. We talked last night, and I was on my laptop comp computing different, you know, actually transcribing one of the censuses, smaller censuses yesterday into a spreadsheet because I like to be able to manipulate the information and play with it and pull things back and forth. Um, and it's, it's just really intriguing. So one of the things that we've learned, um, I kind of go back and forth on the French Canadian piece because with all of the Ogers and Laternals and Vadnesses and Lemires and, and Lavassers and Prontos and Peltiers and I don't even know who I've missed. Uh, <laughs> Labors and Labars and the, yeah, exactly, Lamots and they're everywhere. Um, and one of the things that we found, um, that I think is interesting is that they are numbers wise they're just they're there they had big families as Peggy talked about um, and they came in big groups uh, and stuck together but the other piece that I think is interesting is their presence is very well known they were active they were not necessarily farmers uh, although some of them were certainly um, but they would get into the community they would get into the downtown or into the the infrastructure and be part of the village government, or be part of the fire department, or be part of the church structure, or be part of, or business owners, private business owners in town. Whereas a lot of the German immigrants, or Norwegian immigrants, or Irish, or whomever, would come and they would farm, which was wonderful, but they would do their piece and not necessarily be involved in some of the other things as commonly. So I think the French Canadian names are very, very present in a lot of the infrastructure as well. Um, 
the, uh, the other piece from the census data that's sort of fascinating to me is that the French Canadians were here so early that the data is misleading. Because you start to look at it and it says, you know, where were you born? Well, I was born in Minnesota. That's because your family was here in 1830. You know, of course you were born in Minnesota by the 1860 census or whatever, if you were, you know, a young adult. Um, or your family came in the 1840s and you were um, already infiltrated a couple generations or, you know, in here um, a couple generations the, uh, and established things. The, a lot of the other families or nationalities were coming in the 40s and 50s, or 1850s, 1860s, and even up into the 1890s and, and after. Um, and that data shows up more clearly on the census because typically um, even the 1860 census does not show birthplace of parents. It shows the birthplace of the person, but it does not ask for the birthplace of their parents. By 1930, they are asking for that. But if you think about that being someone who was probably born in 1900 or 1910, it's a very different set of demographics. So um, it's, it, this is the sort of thing that I do like snowy winter days to sit and play with and, and roll around and come up with all sorts of, uh, last week was wonderful with <laughs> being sort of sequestered in the house and playing with certain things. But um, are there questions about that or th that activity or about any of the, the topics for any of us really? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Um, so the idea was, um, so, the, so the question is, was it, were the resorts for the wealthy? Of course, some of the, the spots, you know, there were wealthy people, absolutely. White Bear was to Minnetonka, White Bear was to St. Paul what Minnetonka was to um, Minneapolis, essentially. So they kind of split, you know, although Minneapolis people would come <coughs> to White Bear and St. Paul people would go to Minnetonka. Um, but essentially, the resorts really, if you were particularly wealthy, you probably had your own summer home or cottage. So it was really more the, the kind of mid-level um, folks who had some means. And if you weren't wealthy, if you didn't have a lot of money, you could actually bring a tent and set up as well. So it was really kind of everybody. It's just your accommodations shifted a little bit. Peggy? And a, an interesting piece, my husband's grandmother was single. Her husband had died. My mother-in-law was born in 1917. Okay. And they lived for most of the year um, down off of Payne Avenue, but in the summer, this just blows my mind. No, they have no money. They, you mm -hmm. know, we're not talking about money. Mm -hmm. They would rent a house in Willerney every <laughs> single <laughs> summer, and they would they would rent a furnished house on Payne Avenue, uh -huh. and she would take these four kids, and they'd rent a furnished uh -huh. cottage in Willerney. And it has always just blown my mind yeah. that that was even an option to do that. They were, they were more mobile, for sure. So if you're renting in one place versus renting in another, it probably didn't you know, matter a huge amount. Um, and I'm always, what amazes me, is, and we have pictures um, to prove this, because I probably wouldn't believe it without a photo, but when people did the tents in particular, and again, they would come, they wouldn't just come for a few days. This wasn't camping like we think of camping today. Um, but it was glamping, like people talk about glamour camping, glamping. Um, they would bring their beds, like the bed frames, the bedsteads. They would hang portraits on the walls of the tent. They would hang like the president's portrait or, or a religious picture on the walls. They would bring dressers, they would bring everything. And it blows my mind because, you know, just to be at the lake. Just, just because you're a trivia buff? Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> thanks Kevin. I'm going to give you one. Yes. You, you were mentioning all of the communities that have uh, property on the lake. Yes. Willerney owns 40 feet. No. I want to know where, because I, I, I hear this all the time, and I want to know exactly where, because I like that. Go to the Four Seasons Drive. Yep. Hang a left as you're heading north. Okay. Go to the end of the road. Okay. Hang a left, and it's right there next to the condos. The condos? We own 40 feet. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I, people tell me that all the time, and I can never make a map tell me that. <laughs> it's like, I want to know exactly where. All right, so now we've got six. <laughs> now, um, Willard had a lot of summer cottages. Absolutely. And we still do. Yeah. Some. Yeah. There, and it's interesting because um, this side of the lake has, has really been slower to give that up. I mean, there aren't a lot, but there are some, much more so than on the Ramsey County side. Um, it's, it's always kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but there are, you know, I think that whole concept of coming out for the summer is still. Well, there's that, there's that wonderful book called Modern Day Memories. Yeah. That has 
all sorts of things in it. But, yeah. um, rumor has it that the Carneys, who were at the mm -hmm. amusement park, uh, rented cottages in Wilmer. Which makes sense. I mean, it just, it's, that's logical, yeah. The, um, so the amusement, I mean, the amusement park had dorms and other facilities, but, you know, if you didn't want to live in a dorm, which I can see why you wouldn't necessarily, um, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Did, did you have your hand up? Well, I'm just wondering if it was a cultural tradition in, for Europeans to take their summer holidays, and, and so that, that tradition of doing that was just... Yeah. Uh, expected. An there was probably some of that. Um, I think the bigger piece um, was more of a push than a, I mean the pole was good coming to the lake was pleasant and enjoyable but it was also the hot stinky city in the summer. Um, in addition to being uncomfortable and unpleasant it was dirty. I mean the sanitary conditions were nasty for many years um, and the health con I mean it just from a health standpoint it truly was healthier. It, White Bear was actually written up in many things as being a health resort and a place to come to revive your health and all of that. Um, even a fountain of youth kind of idea. Um, that's a little bit overkill. But uh, it also wrote that there, were, there, was an, a, there was a lack of mosquitoes, too. So, you know, <laughs> I, I've yet to find that White Bear Lake. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but it, I think that that was part of it, too, was just getting away from the dirty streets and the disease and things that came with that. I've often wondered if Matamidi had a large settlement from the East Coast because of the Chautauqua connection. I think so. Yeah, I think that was a big draw. Um, I, and I think that a lot of the, um, like we talked about the Irish and the British and some of the others that um, came to, you know, Philadelphia and Maine and some of those areas then made their way over, the, yeah, yep. And, and I think the Chautauqua was a, sort of a piece of that. It was, you know, not huge, the populations weren't giant, but they you know, certainly had an impact. Mm -hmm. What motivated the French to move to Minnesota? Heck if I know. Um, basically, typically, I think it was it was primarily it wasn't so much um, French moving to Minnesota. Like I say, our family story is a little bit different, and it had a lot to do with the, the religious wars that were going on in the 1600s, why they moved out of France. Um, but the French moving to Canada, Peggy, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I, I know that it had a lot to do from conversations that we've had and kind of digging into some of that. Um, a lot to do with the fact that France is only so big. And as you have 12 kids at a time and you subdivide these farms and have these spaces, there's only so much room. And the idea was, you know, you can go to Canada where it's, there's lots of land. Um, and then eventually, uh, all throughout Canada, really, if you look across the northern strip of the United States, it's not just Minnesota that has a lot of um, French Canadians. There's, they really kind of came down in little bits and pieces and, and landed down there, so. Originally came to the maritime provinces of Quebec hmm. because it was New France. Right. And then when the British took over, the maritime province folks were kicked out. Pushed. And they yep. Ended up in New Orleans, they're the Cajuns. Yeah. And the French Canadians who stayed were sort of the labor class. Yes. And, and they kept moving farther and farther west. Yep. And they were part of the voyageurs, and they were part of the. the and um, I know my family came in because of the timber trade sure. in northern Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so I think there, there wasn't a clear border in right. so much as Right, right, just sort of trade. smooshed I, down, yeah. But I think as they, as they moved farther west and land became available and the timber trade was there and there were other things that they could Well, and, and so. as they came through Wisconsin, you know, the UP and Wisconsin and, and Minnesota, because of the voyagers and the fur trade right. relationships that were built with the Native Americans, there was more familiarity, more language barriers that they could get through, things like that. So it kind of drew down along the rivers in different places. So um, I'm getting the sense that we're ready. <laughs> Kathy's moving. I don't, we're, we're basically about time, but I, I'm happy to be um, thoughtful of your time and, and the snow accumulation, whatever's going on out there. Um, but uh, feel free to um, pass the send the sheets forward. Lisa can help collect those if you would, um, unless you really want to keep them for some reason. But uh, other than that, thank you so much for coming out this morning and, and being here and being a part of this. And uh, happy to chat more if anybody wants to. So.